Today, I'm so happy to be talking with Elaine Taylor Klaus. I'm Catherine Ellison. I'm a journalist and author and co author of half a dozen books, including the family memoir Buzz, A Year of Paying Attention. Elaine, where are you calling from? And tell us what you do. I am zooming in from Atlanta, Georgia, and I am the co founder and creator of Impact Parents, which is an online resource that provides training, coaching, and support for parents of what I like to call complex kids. I, too, am the author of several books, including The Essential Guide to Raising Complex Kids with ADHD, Anxiety, and My Family. This all gets started. As from what I'm reading online, you found yourself with one complex kid. And Three complex kids. They all, all show their complexities at once. It's so funny. It was like dominoes. And this happens often in families. First one's diagnosed, then another. And at some points, my husband can't be responsible for all of this neurology, <laughs> so I'm diagnosed. I had three complex kids in the 90s, back at a time where there was a lot of support available for our kids, but very little available for parents navigating these choppy waters. My eldest kid defied description or diagnosis because they were ultimately diagnosed with many things. So it wasn't like I could go to a support group and get the answer or get support because none of it really fit. When I discovered coaching, I discovered a different way of being in the world that really supported my kids more effectively and me as a parent. You say you have three kids and all have been diagnosed with ADHD? All with ADHD, all with anxiety, some with dyslexia, some with depression, one with autism. It's a complex neurological soup in my home. But the common denominator might be ADHD. And is it inattentive for all of them or a mix? Every one of us are combined types. So we all have inattentive. We all have hyperactive. And can you tell me a little bit about how you realized that you also were diagnosable? when I couldn't explain what was going on with my kids. And as I started to learn about it as a parent, as we become more and more educated, we begin to see ourselves in ways that we didn't know growing up. It was just, you know, that was normal. I was on my way back to graduate school and trying to go get a PhD to support parents when I thought I should get evaluated and see if if I might need some accommodations. Um, What made you you think that? Because I had an aha moment. It's pretty typical, just standing behind my kid as he was taking the tests and realize every question applied to me. Did you also? I think a lot of it was that. And I started looking back in my life. I remember going to my mom in eighth grade and saying, I think I'm going crazy. And having them take me to a therapist for an hour. He said, she's fine and sent me out the door. And realizing that I had an older sibling who had been diagnosed in the 60s when it was still minimal brain dysfunction. Oh, wow. It was bald ADHD. I was classic in a lot of ways. I was a high achiever, but I burned out. That was your sibling a, a boy? Yeah. One of the things that we're looking at, so many girls slip under the radar. Girls yeah. didn't have ADHD yeah. until, right. until Sarah Solder wrote a book in, 90, in the 90s. Oh, well, wow. turns <laughs> out. We girls do have it too. It was the combination of factors. I just couldn't deny anymore that it looked too familiar. When you thought you were going crazy in eighth grade, you were having some symptoms that you now see were typical of ADHD. I had a lot of social anxiety. ADHD can look very different in girls. I wanted to please. I was trying to do everything they asked me to do. It was just harder for me. They kept telling me how smart I was. If I was so smart, why couldn't I... Fill in the blank. Clearly with anxiety. I worked so hard. And I was trying actually to change schools because I was so unhappy. I ended up realizing I wasn't going to be any happier if I changed my peer group. It wasn't until after college because in college, I ended up accommodating for myself. I didn't realize I was doing it. When I was finally diagnosed in my 40s, I was diagnosed with both attention and learning issues. I know where my daughter's dyslexia came from. I did things like take speed reading courses and they would never really help. I did all these things as a young adult to help myself be successful. Mm -hmm. When I got to college, I took classes where I could write papers, but I didn't have to take tests. Mm. I didn't know why I was doing it, but that was how I accommodated for myself. You toughed it out. You had a career before you went back for your PhD. I never actually went back for the PhD. I discovered coaching and I discovered a way of 
being that was so in alignment with who I was. It really helped. When I became a coach, I became a much, much better parent. How old were your kids when they were diagnosed? Gosh, my eldest was diagnosed at five. And then the second child was in second grade, and that was the dyslexia. And then the third kid, I knew. I knew really early. I don't even know when we finally got an, ac an actual diagnosis because we just, by that point, we knew what we were looking at. When I was diagnosed, I remember calling my mom on the way home and saying, hey, mom, guess what we've got? <laughs> were you diagnosed in between your second and third kid or how did that come about? I don't remember exactly. There was this 10-year period of my life that was a blur. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> you know, I was just trying to stay on top of it. I, I felt like I was juggling and the balls kept falling, you know. Working outside the house while you were having these young Sometimes uh -huh. I, was, I started off, actually, I left working full-time when I had my first kid. I had had a late pregnancy loss and I needed to stop traveling as much as I was. In hindsight, I've always been a bit of a workaholic. True to form with ADD, whatever I do really intensely. I couldn't work in that job the way I was working and have a family. I shifted and, and I morphed and, and I did a number of other things before I got here. This work became a compulsion, almost like I had to bring this back to parents because it transformed my life so much. Everybody was telling parents what to do, but nobody was helping us figure out how. So many of your clients are, are girls, young girls. I work with parents, parents. not okay. there are everyone. I, we work with parents of kids four to 44, male, female, trans, whatever. Do you, do you find a, a lot of girls or not that many girls? Sure. Like, it's hard to say. I have no idea. The parent may have one kid, two kids, right. five kids. It's not as much about the kid as it is about helping a parent get their head around who is this kid and what do they need from me as a parent. If I'm a parent who is neurodivergent, or I like to call it neurospicy, <laughs> then what do I need to do to manage myself to be the best parent I can be? If my kids are neurospicy, how do I meet them where they are so right. I can help them be their best selves without creating all of the, the blame and shame and self-esteem cycles that come with that's, having these neurological challenges as a kid? Yeah, that's so true. There's starting to be some research on the specific problem of kids parents with ADHD, raising kids with ADHD, because it can be a recipe for such chaos. True, but so can the recipe of a parent without ADHD with a kid yeah, with I ADHD. Guess. It's just a different kind of fraught. Okay, you know? so tell me about the fraught and tell me about the advantages of having it. The fraught is when you have a parent who doesn't understand, who really can't get, why can't my kid just fill in the blank? There's a disappointment cycle. There's a blame and shame cycle. There's a constant feeling of disappointment and a kid's constantly feeling like they're being a disappointment. When you have a parent who understands it themselves, there's a, a fork that the parent understands it themselves and have really learned to manage it or are learning to manage it in the process of having their kids diagnosed. Then there's this beautiful transparency that can happen. Right. You experienced this with your son. We went through it together. There's this ability to say, let's figure this out together. I don't know what this is going to be or how we're going to do this, but we can do this. And here's how it shows up for me. Here's how it shows up for you. Let's figure it out together. It's when you have a parent who doesn't yeah. get it for yeah. themselves and isn't learning to self-regulate, then you've got a whole other fraud. <laughs> you've got the balls right. dropping, which was it's, it's, it's fundamental because you can have it. And maybe have some sort of compassion. You can know you have it, see it in a child. But unless you've figured out how to regulate yourself, you're going to end up in the, in the worst kinds of clashes. You absolutely yeah. can. <laughs> the parent perspective is either there's nothing wrong with him. He's just like me. I, I pushed through it. Why can't they? There, there are like 15 avatars of the different ways that parents respond. How we respond influences how they respond. For sure. So, How many so, of your children are girls, Elaine? That's a really interesting question. <laughs> oh, okay. Because there's a they in there. I, I have one girl, one boy, and one who's trans non-binary. We did want to focus in particularly today on your advice for parents of, of girls okay. or, and, and also non-binary people who, who might not get diagnosed, as happened to us, as readily as boys who act out. 
What kind of special advice do you find yourself giving to parents of girls? Part of it is understanding, understanding what's happening with the executive function. Right. When parents understand that it's not that they're not listening or that they're being rude or disrespectful. Right? We have that tendency to interpret our kids' behavior as if they're doing it to us, whether it's a girl or a boy or non-binary. But oftentimes the, the stereotype of the inattentive girl with ADHD, right? She's staring out the window. She's twirling her hair. She's spaced out and lost in some way. We see that she's smart, but there's a but, right? The biggest focus for parents is to understand where their strengths are and where their challenges are. If you've got a kid who has a tendency to process information slowly, which is very common with girls with an attentive ADD, or a girl um, who may not be hearing the first time you call, you may want to make sure you have a way to get their attention. My, my house, I used to always say, get it and hear what they repeat back. Got it. Good. <laughs> there were language patterns we would say, do I have your attention? Rather than talking to them before I had their attention. That's probably the best advice I can give for anybody with inattentive ADD. Yeah. Just to make sure you have their attentive first, attention first and then get them to acknowledge what they heard. Right? Yes. Um, don't assume that they're listening. Just, they may they, have been listening, but they may not have heard exactly what you wanted them to hear because they're processing information differently than you do. Speaking of that, do you find that you're often speaking to parents who might have ADHD and don't know that they have it? Very mm -hmm. often. There are parents who either don't know they have it or who see it almost as a style. Yeah, I have a little ADD. <laughs> no, you either do or you don't. There's this misunderstanding that it's a personality mm -hmm. and right. ADD is right. not a personality. It's a way that the brain is wired that influences how we think and how we plan and how we focus and how we didn't feel. It influences everything. So yeah. yeah. How do you deal with that? <laughs> Years ago, I learned something from Ned Hallowell. He used to say that he, when he was interviewing parents, he would say, and which one of you has it? <laughs> <laughs> I may not go that presumptive, but I will say, is there any neurodiversity in the parents and the family? Usually, if they don't know they've got it, they'll tell you about a sibling or an aunt or a, somebody else. But just in our world, we call it dropping breadcrumbs. Sometimes you have very overt conversations. Once you've been working with someone, you have permission to coach them. But when you're just meeting them of and course. getting to know yeah. them, drop some breadcrumbs. And if I ask some questions that have them start starting to wonder, Typically, they'll come back the next time ago. I was thinking about it and I looked it up. Because what you say, it's so fundamental. If they have it too, for them to be good parents of a, a child with ADHD, they have to know how to manage it in themselves. That's something you, you've written about for yourself. What did you have to learn besides, do I have your attention? What did you have to learn about self-management to deal with your children? Oh, wow. That's a huge... <laughs> um, um, it was the this... three top tips. <laughs> yeah. Part of it is understanding myself. For a lot of parents, it's about self-regulation. Whether it's managing your impulsivity or managing your emotionality or wh whatever it is, the first thing to do is to keep yourself out of it. Hmm. And I know that's con conflicting with what I said earlier, which is you can get in with there with your kid and say, let's figure this out together. That's the problem solving part. But there's a lot that happens before you get to problem solving. In fact, most of ADD management, I think, happens before you get to problem solving. You really have to understand it well enough to know how it's showing up and where the strengths are and where, where the challenges are. It's really about knowing what my triggers are, mm. knowing what's going to get me reactive, knowing what I need to do to take care of myself. And we often say in our community, if you don't know where to focus, there are two places to look. Start with self-care and building your relationship. Nice. Because those are the two foundations. If I take care of me as a human being, so I'm not stressed out and reactive and defensive, and if I lean into my relationship with my kid, whatever age, that's going to build the foundation and the trust for me to have better communication. It all stems from there. All the collaborative parenting we want to do happens when, the, when you've got relationship, trust, and communication. you got to take care of the foundations. And the third thing I would say is that 
it's really more about who we're being than what we're doing. Hmm. We get really caught up in, am I doing the right thing for my kids? Am I being consistent? Am I using a schedule at whatever it is? Parents, when they're struggling with their own ADD, they usually say, I can't do this because I can't be consistent. Consistent is like a four-letter word in ADD land. You don't have to always be 100% consistent. Consistency isn't the goal. Consistency is part of the process that you use to achieve the goal of hmm. creating an environment that's got some boundaries so there's some reliability, for example. But when we hold fast to the structure instead of using the structure as a tool towards a larger end, that's when we get stuck with the doing. When we focus on who am I being and am I being calm and connected? Am I being in relationship with this kid? Am I being understanding of what they're struggling with and dealing with? Am I being compassionate? Am I being reasonable? based on their developmental capacity. When we focus on who we're being, that sets us up to do the kind of parenting that our kids need us to do. That's just so beautifully said. I, I know that there's a ton of research that says that for therapists, it doesn't matter what kind of therapy you're doing. It really right. does. You could be doing Freudian or cognitive behavioral training, but it's the relationship that matters. And I think exactly. that that's true with parenting too. The tension I had was to make sure that there's a lot of love between us, but I don't want to spoil them. I don't want to say yes to everything. I'm sure you get that a lot. Yeah. Too. Oftentimes what you'll see is one parent who's being overly permissive in re reaction to another parent who's being overly strict. Yeah. And both are coming at it from the same love for their kid. When we stop letting it be about, I should do this or I should do this, and we start looking at what does this kid need right now? And what this kid needs right now may be different from what they need at eight o'clock tomorrow morning or eight o'clock tomorrow night. Absolutely true. And yeah. all the that's nuanced. Yeah. All the parenting books practically tell you they need consistency. They need limits, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. I, I do what I do in part because... I did what the parenting books told me to do, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. That made me feel worse. It yes. made me feel like a total failure as a parent. It made me really worried for my kids. It wasn't until I was sitting in a, in a lecture hall with Wendy Mogul, who wrote The Blessings of a Skin, mm -hmm. and I raised my hand and I said, what if your kid has special needs? And she says, then this doesn't apply to you. Oh, wow. Well. And I was and like, wait, well, what? <laughs> so when I wrote The Essential Guide, I really was writing a typical parenting book for kids who aren't so typical. We needed a parenting approach that works for neurodiverse kids and doesn't just make us feel like we're a failure because our kids aren't doing what neurotypical, if that even exists, yeah, whatever neurotypical it, might be. Yeah, realistic expectations is yeah. part of it too, right? You see all the other kids, it's like peer pressure and you think that, why isn't my kid doing that? <laughs> right. Because our kids are developmentally three to five years or about 30% behind their same age peers in some aspects of their development, but not all. We don't know when is it okay and when is it not. We've got to shift our expectations to meet them where they are, not where somebody else tells us they should be. Elaine, do you ever talk to parents who have not diagnosed their child yet? They just know some things. Yeah. And how early, do you have any kind of guideline about how early you would want them to get diagnosed with ADHD? The earlier, the better. Yeah. <laughs> when parents come to me and they say, my kid was just diagnosed, I always say, congratulations. Now you know what you're dealing with. Right. When you know what you're dealing with, you can to learn to navigate it. Parents come to us a lot and say, I don't want to get a diagnosis because I don't want the stigma. I don't want my kid to be labeled. I don't want them to use it as an excuse. It's a very classic kind of traditional parenting approach. Mm -hmm. My response goes something like this. You don't give your kid an explanation for what they're struggling with. What they make up is a whole lot worse. They're going to make up that they're yeah. lazy, crazy, or stupid. For sure. So be hearing that anyway. Yeah. From but other they start telling themselves. It starts around grade school. If you catch them really early in those four to six years and help them it's just, oh, this is how your brain works. We're going to do this way. They are very responsive. We collaborate well with preschoolers and then they go to grade school and we go back into director mode and our kids don't react, respond to it as well. Once they get into the elementary school years, that's when they start 
beating themselves up. And it's a catch because you don't want it to be too soon be, to be able to screen for learning disabilities, right? They need to have some reading capacity to be able to make sure that they don't have learning disabilities, but you don't want to wait too long to miss the chance for early invention. Whenever you think you've got something going on with your kid, it's a good time to talk to a provider and start asking questions. As early as preschool or? Yes, absolutely. Or, yeah. yeah. No, definitely not too early. Preschool. And what should parents be looking for if, if ADHD is an issue? So varied. There are so many different presentations, but, but with little kids and, and through elementary, if you've got the bright kid that is not hitting the milestones you would expect them to hit, whether at school or at home, or maybe they walking into the other room, forgetting something, if they're very forgetful, if you hear yourself using words like scattered, spacey, forgetful, need, feeling you need to nag, if, they, if I don't remind them, they'll never do it. That's another buzz term. Ross Green talks about behaviors are a symptom. Mm -hmm. When we see unwanted behaviors, we want to really explore, is this kid really rude or bad or disrespectful? Or is this kid struggling to be respectful right now? Is this kid struggling to pay attention? Is this kid having a hard time processing this direction? Do they need one step directions instead of three? Those are some indicators that people might look for. That's great. When you coach parents, are you do you often find yourself recommending medication or are, or do you lean more in the other direction, behavioral techniques? Recommended treatment is for kids under the age of six is behavioral parent training. For kids six to 12, it's a combination of medication and behavioral parent training. And for kids 12 and up, it's medication with optional parent training, but it seems to be more and more clear that it probably needs to go all the way through 18. In our experience, we do a lot of work with parents of teens and young adults. We're seeing the value of parent intervention all the way into adulthood. It's not about medication. It's about what I would call activating the brain. Hmm. Parents need to understand is this is happening in the brain. We've got to help our kids activate their brain. And whether you do it with medication, meditation, nutrition, exercise, each family has to make their decision about how they want to approach treatment. But we've got to start with the understanding that what's happening has to do with the pathways in the brain. It, it's basic science and chemistry. Our kids need our support in helping them to activate their brains and understanding what it takes to activate their brains. I, there's one other thing I think is really important. What are the things that I think is missed in navigating these complex issues is we know what the recommended treatment is. But providers don't always understand what the recommended treatment is. They're often not making the referrals that parents really need them to be making. They send parents to a website or they give them a couple of links and they think that they've referred them to parent training. They send an eight-year-old kid to talk therapy and think they've done behavior therapy. The one thing that I'm really concerned about is that we still have a long way to go in terms of educating providers to what the experts mean when they talk about comprehensive treatment. Mm -hmm. There is a huge need. What, what our patients need from providers more than anything is for the provider to actually explain to them that they're in this for the long haul. Mm -hmm. This is a management issue, not something we're going to fix with a pill. Oh, Pills without skills are not going to serve this kid for the long term. What parents need to hear more from providers is you can do this and you have a role to play. Your role matters. This is not just about finding the right medicine. The medicine rounds the corners so we can help your kid get the skills they need to learn to manage it. That piece of education is something we need to be screaming from the rooftops. It's something that the providers who are diagnosing and treating kids need to be reinforcing. Parents really feel a lot of guilt and shame around getting parent training. They feel like they've done something wrong. They shouldn't need to. If they knew, and I was like this, I shouldn't have to need it. Right. Just like our kids don't want to need help. We don't either. Right. Right. And the more we ask for help and model that for our kids, the more we can set them up for success by teaching them one of the biggest life skills they're ever going to have to ask for and accept help. Mm. 
I so agree with you. Parents matter so much. And there's been such controversy through the years. I don't know if you're familiar with that book, The Nurture Assumption, which did a lot of damage. Um, well, there was a whole PR campaign against ADHD in the 90s. It did a huge amount of damage for yeah. probably two or three generations of people being diagnosed but not properly treated or not even being diagnosed because there was fear of this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But also just the idea that parents really couldn't change anything. It was just peers and genetics that were yeah. the, totally the influences on you. That made me wonder if anything I did would matter. It makes no sense. I know. Well, on the one hand, they blame parents for the behavior challenge. But on the other hand, there's nothing <laughs> you can do. You just can't win. But you can win. But you can. You can really make a difference because we really make a difference. Good place to end. Thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.